Perfect. I want to welcome you all to this event, Global Youth Unemployment, a focus on the MENA region. My name is Gada Barsoum. I am professor, I'm a social professor at the American University in Cairo. I'm also the chair of the Public Policy and Administration Department. Um, I'm happy to welcome two wonderful guest speakers, uh, Professor Nicola Ye Yates and Professor Ross Ferguson, um, uh, I'll will, I will introduce our two uh, speakers now and give you a bit of background on, uh, on them. So Professor um, Nicola Ye Yates is the chair of social policy and, uh, at the Department of Social Policy and Criminology School of Global Studies and Social Sciences at the Open University in the UK. She received her PhD from Bristol University and uh, she currently is at uh, the Open University. Her research focuses on transnationalization uh, and globalization as social processes and their impacts on social policy and welfare. Professor Yeats is uh, interested in how social diversity, divisions and equalities and equities are constructed, manifested and contested through transborder social processes. She's written extensively on globalization from above and from below, internationalization strategies of state and non-state actors, and the development of transnational social advocacy and policy networks. Her, rec her recent work includes the relationship between international migration and social and health care, global care chains, and global social policy, uh, global social policy and regional social governance. Currently, she is collaborating with Professor Ross Ferguson on researching global youth unemployment. Her research aims, which is what we're going to hear about today, uh, shedding light on the relationship, relationship between transnational economic, social, and government structures and their influence on responses to youth unemployment nationally and internationally. Uh, youth unemployment is a topic that's close to my heart, and I've written on that, so I truly look forward to listening to both speakers. I would also like to welcome Professor Ross Ferguson. He is a professor of social policy and youth policy at the Open University. He has an extensive background in the sociology of education, having taught and researched in this area from 1982 to 1991. I don't mention those years. I stopped doing that on my bio. Since then, his research interests have centered on the governance of young people and policy development at the intersection of social policy and youth justice policies. As a member of the UK Public Social Policy Association and former member of the editorial board of Journal of Social Policy, Professor Ferguson's work has received international recognition for his contribution to the fields of education, employment, welfare, and crime. His research focuses on disadvantaged young people, exploring the adverse effects of normative concepts of youth transitions and the stigmatization of unemployed school leavers. Professor Ferguson's research also examines the positioning of young people within welfare systems and conditions of recurring failures of demand for their labor and the effective criminalization of some groups of non-participants. His, his cross-disciplinary transnational perspectives draw on sociology, so, uh, political economy and labor market analysis, as well as social policy and youth criminal justice fields. Most recently, his research has highlighted how transnational economic, social, and governance structures drive national responses to youth unemployment, Professor Ferguson has held various quality assurance and governance roles at the Open University and was recently a reviewer of degrees at undergraduate, master, and taught um, doctoral, doctoral levels in higher education institutions in England and Scotland that are validated by the Open University. Without uh, further ado, let me um, stop here and welcome our two speakers. Uh, I think they're going to talk for 30 minutes. So the floor is yours. Please go ahead. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Garda. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, Garda, for that very kind um, uh, introduction also to the MENESP team, uh, and in particular, Rana, for inviting us here today to present and share our research with you. And to you all, uh, of course, for making time uh, to discuss this important matter of uh, social policy. Um, how, whatever prefix we might put in front of that. Um, so I'm not very familiar with Zoom, I'm going to do my best here. Um, thank you very much uh, for the uh, invitation, so I'll crack on. Um, and uh, I'm just going to start with a bit of an overview about what's our book about. So our study is about the uh, about youth unemployment, obviously, as it says on the cover, and specifically it's about the incidence, distribution, dynamics, and impacts of youth unemployment on a worldwide basis and from a globalist perspective. So we take a broad view of youth unemployment, not just as open unemployment comprising of people signing on and receiving benefits, but also hidden unemployment, those who are jobless, underemployed, vulnerably employed or warehoused in education or training schemes. And our curiosity to look more closely at this issue on a worldwide basis was prompted in part by statistics such as this, this pie chart, which shows the growth in uh, the proportion of 15 to 24 year olds who are unemployed uh, between 1991 and 2020. Uh, so you can see there's been a sizable increase um, of uh, young adults who've, uh, who are have been unemployed. So, and the fact that unemployment has seemingly become endemic, and I'll say a bit more about uh, the term endemic or the prefix endemic um, in a moment. Um, but I just want to keep on this on this track for the moment, just to give you some overview statistics. So, uh, the high rates of unemployment are a universal or seem to be universal, entrenched, and enduring characteristic of the world economy across continents and state types. Uh, political and economic and welfare system types. Indeed, in much of Africa, Asia, Europe and beyond, unemployment has been consistently sustained between 30 and 50 percent of the youth labour force. And here also we see massive gender inequalities uh, with the unemployment rates of young women being on average 16 to 18 percentage points higher than those of young men. So in the study itself, uh, which uh, published this book, uh, we looked at more than 100 countries, as many countries as had reliable data. So we looked at more than 100 countries across all continents, regions and country income groupings and over the course of more than a century. And to our knowledge, uh, ours is the first study to combine, uh, or the first comparative study uh, to combine such extensive internationalism within uh, with a long, very long historical frame. But ours isn't just another cross-national comparative study of youth unemployment, important though those types of studies are. Our book has sought to, we've consistently sought to offer a new history of the global political economy of labour in general and of youth labour uh, in particular, we wanted to focus on the dynamics of global economies and labour forces and their global governance and to bring a different perspective into an academic field which remains by and large characterised by country level studies of so-called national institutions and domestic governance arrangements of work, education and welfare. So we've been incredibly, uh, we're incredibly focused on uh, highlighting the transnational political economic structures and institutions as key drivers shaping young people's terms of inclusion into work and jobs and their exclusion from both. Um, up until which point, particularly in relation to this, this topic, um, it's been uh, such forces have been treated as part of where we've been treated as passive as part of the background or part of the context. And we wanted to begin to rectify that. So this book is very much about uh, the significance of age in the global political economy of labour, how, why, when and where it matters. We marshal a wide range of evidence uh, 
historical and contemporary as to why unemployment hits young people harder than older adult groups, how it's produced and reproduced within and between generations, countries and continents, the impacts of it in terms of the scarring of young unemployed people, uh, the scarring they experience, the advantages of youth unemployment to owners of capital and employers and the political repercussions for governments. And uh, because this is a social policy study, what is to be done about it? So at this point, I'd just like to emphasise two summary statements that encapsulate central theses of our book. And the first is that just as labour in general is a major social force actively shaping globalising dynamics, then so too also is youth labour. So young adults uh, in this study or young adults are not just another age specific group of uh, adults being young in a globalising economy or globalising economies carries special so social significance. For employers, for example, as we detail so meticulously in the book, youth signals the body and mentality and the structural social pos position of the ideal that they so cherish. The second summary statement is that, in fact, following on from the first, is that age matters. It matters greatly, immensely, and the, to the degree that we think has not really been properly appreciated so far, or at least as, not as much as it should be. Young people are differentially and severely impacted by routine economic dynamism, the routine workings of the economy, as well as by economic and financial crisis. So it's not just in times of crisis where we see, for example, uh, you know, young uh, youth unemployment rates rocket, but also in times of normality or so-called normality and ostensible stability. So this is a systematic um, uh, approach. Their labor, its use and abuse in the past and today is a central focus of the book. So I'm just going to move on now and just give you a very brief overview of the book structure. Um, and we, we've divided this into what we call three terrains. Um, the first is about how young labour is differentially embroiled in globalisation processes, including the terms of their inclusion within and exclusion from so-called new economic opportunities within the global economy. Uh, and those correspond broadly with chapters two, where we discuss uh, the concept of endemic youth unemployment, which we're going to come on to in just a moment uh, as a social policy issue. Uh, and then chapters three and chapters four locates youth unemployment in relation to the size and shape of the global youth labour force and the ongoing restructuring of the world economy over the last century or so. The second train uh, looks, hones in on the impacts of global economic and financial crises on young members of the workforce. So two chapters here deal with those impacts, chapters five on financial crisis, uh, other than the global financial crisis, um, and chapter six, which deals much more squarely with the effects of the global financial crisis on the, on the youth labour force. The third terrain concerns global governance. It's the institutional architectures of global social governance and policy formation as regards youth unemployment. So two chapters that deal with these, chapters seven and eight, uh, basically cover a century's worth of, um, how shall I put it, activism or advocacy or uh, creating a field of, of, of research and uh, action um, as regards the youth labour force and uh, putting in place uh, formal and informal regulations uh, concerning uh, the global economy uh, and welfare systems. Um, so that's the that's the overview of the book structure. Um, but I want to before I move on to the data part, or before Ross and I move on to the data part of our talk, I want to introduce a key concept in the book, that of endemic 
youth unemployment. So this concept uh, is one we devised and deployed deliberately and specifically for this project. We use it to convey a fundamentally different set of social meanings about youth unemployment and the significance of youth unemployment that other terms like long term unemployment, mass unemployment, structural unemployment don't didn't to us really seem uh, to capture. So although, of course, we now all, as we now all know, having been through the pandemic, uh, we know that the concept of endemic has its origins in epidemiology regarding the spread of disease following epidemic trajectories. Um, our use of the, or our insertion of the prefix endemic in front of youth unemployment captures the prevalence, the persistence and permanence of youth unemployment at the societal level. So for the purposes of identifying extremes of persistent mass unemployment, endemic youth employment, we can find our coverage to young people aged 16 to 24 years old and concentrated our analysis um, on a variety of contexts in which the higher extremes of unemployment can be identified. Um, so to give you a working definition of endemic youth employment that we used, it's this now. So unemployment among 16 to 24 year olds, which reaches the rate of 15 percent and above for periods of at least 10 years during the most recent three decades. And of course, uh, the, uh, we were doing the research of this book um, in about 2019-20. Uh, so the, so hence the, the ending in 2019, uh, which corresponds to our study. And this cutoff of 15% um, is in some ways uh, arbitrary, but what we wanted to do uh, by having a cutoff point is have a clear marker or simply a way of concentrating attention on the upper extremes of youth unemployment and at rates which do not normally feature at the foreground of analysis. Um, so it's often submerged or contained within uh, other analyses of unemployment described as structural or mass um, or long term, but endemic youth unemployment is trying to convey something a little bit different um, compared with um, uh, other studies. So at this no, I'm not going to hand over, I beg your pardon. Um, so to get behind the abstractions, uh, which uh, I've necessarily had to start with um, and to start give you a flavour of some of the data, uh, I'm going to just briefly illustrate some concrete um, aspects of the sorts of things that I've been talking about uh, in the past few moments. Um, so this first uh, figure, I guess, um, uh, looks at world unemployment rates aged 15 to 24 year olds and 25 years plus uh, over a 20 year period, um, including, and you'll see this when I start the graphic, there'll be a, a, a line coming up from 2008, 2009, uh, 2007, 2008, which signals the global financial crisis. Um, so I'm just gonna start this off and then just gently Talk. There we go. Uh, so this one is showing the continuous growth of youth unemployment since 91 uh, and comparing the clear differential between unemployment on a world basis uh, amongst adults or older adults compared with younger adults. And of course, note here that um, this is this is the line. I, this is the vertical line I was discussing. That's where the financial crisis uh, kicked in. Uh, the second one uh, distinguishes between different country groups, uh, country income groups, which as we know is a, many of you may know is a, is a World Bank uh, um, concept. Um, uh, and this figure shows the continuous rise in youth unemployment rates over this period in lower middle and especially upper, upper middle income groups. Uh, and we'll see here, I'll just start this off. Uh, there we go, there's the financial crisis going up there in 2008. So we start with low income countries uh, and they're a special case data wise and they had the low middle income countries on a continuous rise uh, over these 30 years. 
uh, as well as upper middle income groups. And finally, we have the high income group coming along here, which uh, peaks in terms of youth unemployment and then comes back down uh, quite substantially to pre-GFC uh, uh, levels of unemployment, whereas the lower middle income countries and upper middle income countries have uh, been have seen a continuous um, rise um, of youth unemployment. So at this point, I'm going to hand over uh, to Ross, who will take you to the next part of the uh, of the talk. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, or good morning, or good evening, according to where you are. Thanks for welcoming us. Um, okay, so for the next 10 minutes or so, um, uh, I'm going to look at some of the major youth unemployment issues, specifically in the MENA region, um, building on substantial sections of the, of the book that Nicola has just been describing. Um, in what's to follow, uh, we take a closer look at youth unemployment by age, by gender, and by duration of periods of youth unemployment, uh, both across territories within MENA and outside of that region, um, not least to get uh, context and comparison. Um, the supposed causes of youth unemployment are, of course, a subject of separate discussion. And uh, if we had time, we might even get onto that later on, though. It's a, it's a big uh, separate subject in, it, in, it, in its own. So um, uh, this is a bit to and fro now. Nicola's going to just uh, set okay. up the next slide. Yeah, and talk so thank you. So I'm um, just, so this first, uh, uh, I guess this is a table actually, rather than a figure, this table, uh, distinguishes uh, between ILO world regions uh, uh, which have a youth unemployment rate of 15% plus and if you remember 15% um, was the cutoff uh, threshold for our definition of endemic youth unemployment so this is over this period 1991 to 2019. I was going to talk you through the kind of the structure of the table before we go on to look at the uh, the uh, the fifth and sixth column. So we've organized these into ranks, um, one to seven uh, by world region. On the top row here, we have obviously the rank, uh, the world subregion, uh, the total number of countries in the subregion, um, uh, the youth unemployment rate at or above, and we've distinguished between 15%, 20% or 30%, depending on whether the data is available um, or whether it's uh, applicable uh, in that region, uh, we provide them the years at this rate and uh, perhaps the most crucial of all is the total number of years at that rate. Okay, so uh, we just thought it'd be useful to break this down because it's quite a complicated table. So back to you, Ross. Okay, can we now go on to the next uh, table then? Thank you, that's great. So, um, I won't talk you through this in great detail. We've highlighted the most important areas. Um, so at uh, uh, regional level, and we're definitely working at world region, we come on to talk about individual countries later on at regional level, uh, North Africa, right at the top of the list, sustained youth unemployment rates at uh, above 15 or 20% for um, uh, um, the whole 29 period, 29 year period that we cover up to 2019. And then after that, youth unemployment rose 30% and above. Um, and that that's over 14 years in North Africa um, and uh, included, including most of the years um, uh, above, um, uh, above, beyond the past uh, 2011, right through to 2019. Um, then again, if we we if we skip uh, rank two and go on to rank three, Arab states, um, uh, regional level, the Arab states uh, uh, sustained youth unemployment rates at or above 15% uh, for uh, for for our whole 29 year period. Uh, but in addition. Uh, for nine of those years, the Arab states sustained youth unemployment rates at above 20%, including the most recent period of, uh, of roughly 2013 to 29, 2019. And they're the main ones to carry on. We'll come back and say a bit more about um, uh, that only Eastern Europe approximated to youth unemployment rates uh, 
um, in North Africa collectively and Arab states collectively in terms of both the rates and the duration of these extremes of, uh, of youth unemployment. And clearly Eastern Europe was in itself a special case. Comparable data for all the other four ILO um, world sub-regions uh, in, in there, it's rank, uh, rank number two and then five, six and seven down at the, at the bottom there showed youth unemployment over this 29 year old period, uh, notably below the, below the, 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 the mean rates. Um, uh, that is in terms of either their rates or their, again, their periods of the duration. Other, world, other ILO uh, world sub-regions um, at the bottom of the table um, uh, um, were, uh, are therefore at low levels by comparison with all the ones that we looked at earlier in, in the table. Um, and we haven't even included North America, Australasia, East Asia and Southeast Asia, which had unemployment rates below um, that, those 15 stroke 20% levels. Um, so in summary, the greatest global extremes of prolonged endemic youth and unemployment over the last three decades have clearly been um, those affecting Northern Africa when viewed at world regional level um, and the recurrence of 30 plus rates of 30% um, plus rates of youth unemployment in Northern Africa remain the most extreme episodes um, uh, um, uh, at a world regional level. And then in addition, um, the equivalent composite data for uh, the Arab states in rank three there um, has also been extreme, although only fractionally higher than, than, uh, than rates in, in Eastern Europe. Okay, so go on to the next slide now, I think. Okay, thank you. So this table is going to show, so this is, this, this table enables us to zoom in on uh, countries uh, which we've uh, classified in terms of ILO regions. Uh, so this is about countries, well selected countries with youth unemployment rates um, between 15 and 60 percent um, and I sh think I should have said well for the last table and also for this one I think I'm right in saying this Ross uh, this is actually for recorded unemployment it's not even for hidden unemployment um, yes. So, uh, so yeah, let me just talk you through the table that we're going to show you without the data first. So because of the length of this table, we had to cut it into two. Um, so it's just this is just a continuation of, of that. And we've possibly picked out uh, two MENA regions. So again, we have uh, by rank, so by ILO subregion, but really the focus is on the countries in this table. And then the numbers or kind of different degrees of endemicity, endemicness, uh, between 50% and going all the way up to 60%. Um, so this is the table that we're going to show you, which will be populated with our data, which I'm guessing that you want me to do now. Um, and I think we're going to start with one on the, uh, well, on my left hand side. Yeah. Yeah. Good. OK. Thank, thanks, Nicola. Um, so analysis at country level rather than regional level obviously alters the international ranking of youth unemployment rates in the sense that both uh, Northern Africa and, the, and Arab countries experienced rates and durations of youth unemployment that were in some cases marginally less acute than in, uh, um, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa, the first group in rank, rank there, and the Eastern, Eastern European countries um, in, the, in the, second, the second rank. Um, uh, the highest rates of youth unemployment or the most prolonged periods were in uh, three countries that were not in the MENA region or um, uh, uh, remarkably Namibia and South Africa had rates that went up above 40 and indeed 50% uh, during this period and in South Africa that, that um, uh, those 40% plus rates were uh, continuous right through our 29 year um, uh, period. Um, uh, so uh, then Second to that, going, going down, looking at Eastern Europe, um, similarly that also happens that more surprisingly, perhaps broadly equivalent rates have affected much of Eastern Europe since 1991. Uh, sustained rates up to 30 plus percent were endemic and some reached or exceeded 40, 50 and even 60 percent. So um, there, and it's notable, particularly that Bosnia-Herzegovina and uh, 
um, North Macedonia um, uh, had uh, exceptionally high rates of above six at and above sixty percent for for, uh, for for some periods in that time. Um, that, that obviously uh, associated with the with the Balkan conflicts in particular. And then in the third uh, rank, the um, northern, southern, and western Europe, there are only only three um, countries get in, as it were. But nonetheless, they'd be surprising. Some of the parts of Mediterranean. Southern Europe were also um, exceptional compared to the rest of Europe. Spain, most especially, having prolonged periods of youth unemployment, above forty percent for many years, um, equaling some of the uh, some of the data certainly in the in the in the MENA region. Okay, so if we can give the other half of this uh, um, table now, and we'll look at uh, um, uh, the two MENA areas. Um, despite the, uh, despite avoiding the extremes of uh, um, sub-Saharan Africa and, and so on, other extremes continued to be reflected at country level in, uh, in, in the Arab states and in, and in Northern, Northern Africa. Um, uh, and in the first group, rank four, um, in both sub-regions, in fact, youth unemployment has continued as endemic at rates of 15, 20 and 30%. Um, through most or all of the 29 year period. Um, and uh, um, uh, down in, and you can see that, that some of them got to extreme highs, most notably Algeria um, uh, for 13 of the 29 years was in at 40 percent and indeed it's briefly above 50 percent. Um, uh, so these two are, 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 are um, uh, these two areas and, and countries within them um, are, are very notable for their high and escalating youth unemployment rates. So in summary, at the end of this, I can, I can just put this together fairly succinctly at country level, despite extremes, youth unemployment rates and durations in North Africa and amongst the Arab states are less acutely affected than other ILO world regions, as we've just seen, particularly uh, um, South Africa, West Mediterranean, Europe, etc. Nevertheless, the unrelenting rates of youth unemployment in some MENA countries are clearly persistently endemic throughout almost all of the last three decades. And uh, Algeria, we've all, we've already picked out. We've already picked out. Okay, so thanks. On to the next one, I think. Okay, and this one uh, shows a, a gender breakdown of of youth unemployment focusing on MENA um, in comparison with other world regions. Um, and again, uh, here we go. So yeah, different regions on that first column, the youth unemployment rate uh, followed by the years of at the rate showing the differential between male and female youth unemployment. And critically, the years in the last column, the years that female youth unemployment exceeded that of males. Um, so, Nicola and Ross, as much, as much as I'm enjoying this, can I ask you to wrap in the coming uh, five minutes? So that yes. we are... Oh, goodness. Okay. Totally. Totally. Do you, on it. Let's, let's, um, in no, which that's... case... Uh... I, I can I can abbreviate. I can abbreviate. Let's let's continue to work through the table, um, and then I can make my comments shorter at the end, Ross. Okay. All right. Um, that, that that that's fine. So I won't talk you through how the 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 some of the complexities of putting this table together. I'll just I'll just go very briefly through the through the headlines. Um, the extremes of female youth unemployment in the Arab states are particularly striking. Um, in, in those states in which uh, youth unemployment rates are up to f uh, 15 um, percent youth unemployment in youth unemployment young men and young women are on average equal but in those states in which uh, the rates got higher 20 percent to 40 percent plus the incidence of their unemployment amongst young women hugely exceeds the incidence of young men so looking in arab states look at that uh, 21 and 19 figures on the right that's uh, that's differentiating the two very specifically um, uh, such the overwhelming majority of the 29 years 2019 it was young women not young men who were recorded as uh, unemployed much the same is true of the unemployment 
gender uh, differences in Northern Africa over that period. And the only significant difference in comparison to the day for the Arab states was that young men in Northern African countries were on average almost as likely to be unemployed as young women in the range below 30%. So there is a marked difference there. But in the 30 and 40% plus ranges um, in North Africa, on average across countries, young women were overwhelmingly more likely to be unemployed than young men, just as in the Arab countries. Um, uh, so, um, and then I'll 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 uh, I'll, I'll slip part quickly over the over the over the next bit and uh, and, and 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 pass on. I think because there's nothing absolutely crucial in that lower region, except to point out that in um, parts of uh, northwestern and southern Europe and Northern America and and some other areas, um, there are. Uh, settings in which uh, young women's employment is stronger than young men's. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, so I'm just going to just do some very brief uh, summing up points. Uh, well, not even summing up actually, because um, uh, I want to keep uh, maximum time for for discussion, questions, and things. So, um, so just to say that our data that we've shared with you goes up to. Uh, well, kind of 2018 or so, which is the last data available when we were doing the data analysis. And of course, further analysis given kind of later, uh, later data sets may well reorder uh, the rankings of youth unemployment versus the rest of the world. But I mean, rather than getting into a, another kind of welfare regimes, categorization and recategorization, I mean, maybe there's a you know, there's a there's a bigger point um, to be had. Well, one of which, of course, is about the difficulties. And this is a methodological methodological point about the the issues with data and of data quality uh, that one, as a researcher, uh, encounters uh, when trying to when one goes outside the OECD uh, countries. Um, so the data we've relied on uh, is from the ILO. Um, and another kind of data in other parts of the book, um, I think, have also relied on World Bank uh, data. And of course, that's that's a very particular view of the world. And we deliberately chose what we kind of call a, a nomothetic approach to uh, appreciate, um, you know, this kind of worldwide view, which is in stark contrast to kind of different methodologies, uh, which, of course, are also valuable. It's just that we haven't done them in this book. Um, and this is what we felt we could contribute um, to the discussion. And I suppose uh, the final thing to say is that even though we've adopted a markedly different approach to the study of youth unemployment worldwide, uh, our intention is by no means to replace um, or override, you know, the fantastic detailed country level case studies um, that now exists, but rather to inject a worldwide comparison, an extensively internationalist worldwide comparison to discussions um, about youth unemployment as incidents, dynamics, uh, causes, consequences. So, you know, we see these as complementary um, very much um, and actually potentially, um, and maybe this is a point of discussion, uh, potentially, you know, some scope for further analysis in a way that takes forward this kind of, you know, this intermeshing or uh, integration of a transnationalist, globalist perspective that we've adopted uh, uh, with the methodologically transnationalist approaches, which have tended to dominate the cross-national comparative uh, study. So just one final point, if I may, Garda, I will be, I'll do this in 10 seconds. Um, so just to reiterate that uh, the kind of central points of the book, uh, which is that endemic youth employment and indeed youth employment more generally can only be adequately interpreted and addressed by reference to social organisation and the social relations of labour, work, education and welfare that are global in scope and that span country borders. Um, so I think that's probably, well, should probably end it there and want to thank you all for your attention. Oh, and just one cheeky final slide, uh, just to uh, shamelessly uh, highlight, draw your attention to the fact that it's 50% off the paperback version of the book if you order it online from Edward Elgar using this code GYUWEB. And of course, chapter three is free to access online at any point.
Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think we're gonna open the floor for questions and until we see some hands raised, uh, can you just uh, take advantage of the fact that I am moderating this and ask you questions? Um, I hope that's fine with you. So um, the ILO has a very narrow definition of, I of unemployment. Basically, you should not work for at least one hour in the reference week. You should be ready, willing uh, to work and searching for a job. And searching is a huge issue because if you know that there are no jobs around you, you're not going to search. So you're automatically once asked on a survey, are you searching and you say no, you're automatically taken from the unemployed um, uh, group to the discouraged labor, you're out of the labor force. And so a function of this, uh, and I, I want to specifically focus on the urbanization dynamic that's happening in many countries in the global South, because if you're in a rural area, it's very likely that you find, you'll have to do something during the reference week. You'll uh, just do anything with the, piece of land that you're renting or with the stock that you're uh, that you're raising in, in the household for barter or sale. And then you're going to be considered as employed. Um, so there is huge issue of underemployment uh, in the global south and increased informality. Definitely informality is the name of the game in, in, in countries in the, label, in the global south. And then there is the other issue of being out of the labor force. So the, the unemployed are just a thin group between two large conglomerates, which are those who are out of the labor force and those who are employed or un, uh, but are uh, working fewer number of hours, less than the 40 hours that are considered as full employment or are at, uh, uh, at within the informal economy at less paying jobs or jobs that do not offer them with social protection. So, and I always think that these are the two elephants in the room and the, the thin, the, 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 that thin group in the middle, uh, people who are doing research on the Middle East would say unemployment in the Middle East is structural, not cyclical, it doesn't change much. Because it's usually the unemployment, uh, the unemployment of the educated who have higher expectations. They cannot just take any job, um, and that's why unemployment does not change much with um, with um, economic cycles. Although it can get worse, definitely, but the, the the pattern remains high because it's usually structural. It is a structural unemployment. And of course, it affects women. I mean, we looked at data. I was analyzing data for ILO in Egypt, and women were five times more likely, young women were five times more likely to be unemployed compared to young men. So I totally agree with you on that. So, what are you? I'm, and I'm sure you've been asked this question before. I mean, I think I'm just taking advantage of the fact that I am I'm moderating this and I'm asking you this question about your decision to take unemployment. And, um, and how you consider this, what I think are the two elements of the room, and you could disagree with me. No, no, I absolutely don't disagree with you, Gardner. Sorry, I've just jumped in. I don't know if Ross wanted to come in, but no, since sorry, I've sure. started, sure. then I'll continue, sure. <laughs> as they say. Um, no, absolutely, absolutely agree with you, Gardner. And in fact, the data that he showed you was from the graphs and the tables was actually recorded unemployment. But actually, in other parts of the book, we totally we do actually work more directly with the hidden unemployment data. So uh, chapters uh, three, one of the early chapters. Uh, uh, recalculates youth unemployment as a function of not just registered unemployment, which you say is incredibly narrow and restrictive, but also that of hidden unemployment, which includes those who are vulnerably employed, um, uh, for example, working on family farms or you know in the, or working in the informal economy, but who don't appear within the uh, registered unemployment. Uh, numbers. So in that in that sense, uh, the data that we showed was just the surface of it. So it's massive uh, underestimate. And in fact, one of the things that we've done, which we haven't had time, at least today, to talk to you about, is actually so we calculated the global reserve army of youth labour. 
uh, by combined taking that broader view of youth unemployment to actually get a sense of, uh, you know, the, the size of the combined number of openly unemployed, registered unemployed, and the hidden unemployed, uh, which span, as I said, right from the outset, uh, which spanned um, uh, vulnerably employed, uh, economically inactive, those kind of warehoused in education and training schemes and working in the informal economy. Um, so that, I think, it's just that the data that we showed um, wasn't actually that, that data, um, but we, we, have, we have done it. Um, uh, so yeah, totally agree. I don't know if Ross wants to come in. Just uh, with anything, you're holding your pen up. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Sorry, you meant to be to, to cut you off. Just just very briefly, guard say. I mean, I do entirely take those points. Um, for 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 our starting point in the book, and this was in the in I think the second or third chapter, we had to have an overview that that, that could be consistently applied across all countries for which there is any, anything like reasonable. Um, uh, counting of, of, of unemployment. There, there will be many different versions of what you've described in other, in other, uh, in other regional areas, other parts of the world, and, and we had to, we had to go for, for consistency. Um, that's, uh, that's not an excuse. It's just a sort of a, a referent, um, and, and uh, uh, the kind of uh, nuancing you're bringing to that, I think, is of, of the greatest possible importance. Mm. So I have uh, taken advantage of the fact that I was moderating this. Do we have, uh, are people able to raise their hands? Uh, yeah, sure, Rana could raise her hand, so everybody could do that then. Please go ahead. Hi all, yeah, thank you. Yeah, everyone feel free to post your questions in the chat or, or raise your hand, yeah, if you'd like to comment or ask a question. So um, thanks very much, Nicola um, and Ross. And, I mean, I, I think the first thing I've taken away is absolutely your what you've said is this internationalist perspective about comparing the globe, yeah, and and including in your comparison um, the northern hemisphere, yeah. And I, I was actually quite intrigued by the by the largest group of countries that are northern, western, southern Europe, and uh, from what I could under there's well they have the largest number of countries I think it was forty. Um, but also equally uh, 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 and apparently endemic employment. So so I think I just wanted to say, I think it, it's good, of course. Yeah. So first of all, to have this um, comparison and overview and, and clearly it's sort of the devil is in the details of then just understanding more deeply the dynamics of this. Um, but the the sort of the, the main question was, uh, well, partly kind of two questions. The first one being um, if you could say more about um, the the makeup of you know how to what extent yeah the the size of the group as it were or the length of the time may be connected yeah so what might be the difference what's happening if we're comparing um, the western southern European group of countries that have the twenty nine years um, in comparison to other regions that have those twenty nine years of endemic youth um, employment yeah so how does that uh, map onto the size of the region or other um, dynamics that might be happening. Um, and then a, a smaller kind of much more minor question about um, the the the, reg the countries that you've included in the uh, North Africa and, and Arab um, region, as it were, because I know in some um, definitions, um, they will go as far as including the Comoros Islands or even Mauritius. Yeah, so it's quite an interesting. So just wanted to ask that kind of smaller question. Thanks. I'll, ta I'll take the smaller for, for, um, question first. <laughs> um, and and the, the larger one, I think we need some more thought about. I mean, uh, absolutely. Uh, just pure pure pragmatism of trying to get a picture of, uh, of things globally and, and, and regionally without going to, uh, we did it at a number of points. Um, start looking at, at, at um, uh, uh, remote remote states, um, in island states, very low population states, and so on. And it simply wasn't viable for us to build the whole larger picture. Uh, self self evident, but equally self evident that those things are really important, and one needs to get in, in inside them. And we simply didn't have the bandwidth to do it. Yeah, it wasn't this study, was it? 
Um, uh, and then as regards your bigger question, uh, Rana, uh, the answer is, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, it's, it's a great question um, uh, and a really important one, which, as you say, does get to so what's going on here. So we've got the numbers. Yes, uh, they tell us certain things, but actually, what does it mean in practice? And of course, we know that dynamics will be different. And but as to what can be correlated with with what in here, um, uh, we haven't done that analysis, um, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, but stroke and um, if there's any uh, uh, anybody willing to willing to start to undertake that, which is a major, which a major job uh, in its own right, then we'd be more than willing to, um, you know, talk with people further. Uh, or perhaps it's our future study, Ross. Um, it could be. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thanks for that. Um, and then I just see there's a there's a question in the box from Amal. Um, <clears throat> Can you share with us the main challenges that are hindering the improvement of youth employment in MENA? Um, I'm afraid the answer to that is no, I can't um, either. Um, neither Ross nor myself are MENA uh, specialists. Um, um, so we would absolutely defer <clears throat> uh, to regional specialists or people with expert knowledge of the dynamics of the region, this kind of, you know, the... <clears throat> the details um, or the specifics of, of the countries uh, in the region as to what those are. <clears throat> and we would be uh, more than willing to, um, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, listen and, and learn. Um, and no, I'm afraid we haven't considered the role of artificial intelligence on the future of youth employment um, uh, at all, which is a very different way of looking at, uh, you know, the youth labour force, and one which I know actually is being looked at within the European context um, uh, to some to some degree. Um, so there are studies ongoing um, about that. Though saying that uh, AI has always, or you know, the use of technology, kind of you know, the role of technology in uh, generating uh, employment and more particularly unemployment has been a long-standing concern um, of social science, um, social scientists uh, throughout the world. So, Amal, if you're doing research on that, I don't know, uh, you know, if you're an established um, lecturer or um, student, um, but, uh, you know, maybe this is something, be a really good opportunity to uh, to undertake that because it's sure to be transformative, um, uh, whatever else. Could I just add, I noticed, Amal, right at the beginning of the chat, you asked about um, percentages for Lebanon. Um, uh, and was it because there was no data variable? There was certain there was certainly no ILO data available that, that we thought was sufficiently consistent with uh, the, the 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 totality of what we were looking at to include. And, and of course, there were a number of a surprising number of uh, of, of other um, countries in which in which that was that was um, difficult to to me what we would ideally have liked to have done. On the other hand, you know, a number of countries which one might have thought might have been uh, difficult to have data on, for example, the uh, um, uh, occupied Palestinian areas uh, have an incredibly strong record with ILO of all of their uh, youth unemployment data. It's very, very variable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. That was actually done on the minute. We've answered all the questions. And that is extremely efficient. Um, <laughs> They're always efficient, if nothing else. Give you a reflection, big hand for that. And um, I want to thank you both for such a wonderful presentation. Very, uh, very informative, very um, inspiring. And I truly, I am going to start your work. So. Uh, but that's of course not not much to add. But um, yeah, I'd be very uh, pleased to see what you've done here. It's fantastic, great work. I think it's the outcome of the pandemic, if I can tell from the time you were working on it. Uh, 
So you mm. did put the time during the pandemic into great use. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> for uh, your time and thank you for the presentations. And I want to thank everybody who joined us today for this event. Thank you, Rana. Do you have any concluding comments? Thank you all. Just wanted to thank everyone for your time. Thank you, Marlies yeah. Islam, for bringing this all together. And yeah, hope we meet again for another webinar next month. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. See you bye -bye. soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.